This video is being made during the global coronavirus pandemic of 2020. It presents evidence from a range of scholarly studies and clinical experiments demonstrating that containment of the virus could be improved significantly if at least 50% of the general public wears even basic fabric barrier masks such as surgical masks. Containment would be improved even further if the proportion of mask wearing is raised to 80% of the general public. This video also explains that ventilator masks with filters rated to at least N95 and preferably P100 provide the highest level of protection of any unpowered masks, though they are currently less accessible to the public due to supply shortages and the need to prioritise this equipment for frontline medical service staff. In contrast, simple cloth masks, whether made by hand or industrially, are of much less use and provide very little protection though they are still better than nothing. Codenamed COVID-19 by the World Health Organization in February 2020, the coronavirus disease is caused by the virus Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, named SARS-CoV-2. It is also known as a novel coronavirus since it is a new coronavirus strain. The disease is zoonotic, meaning it originated among animals and later evolved to infect humans. Currently, humans are the most common vector of viral infections in other humans. For convenience, this video will refer to the virus as a coronavirus and the resulting disease as COVID-19. The question of whether or not face masks are effective in reducing the spread of the coronavirus has been hotly debated in the media and within government organisations for the last five months. This video presents an overview of the debate from the time that the pandemic started to the current date 15th of April 2020, and summarises the current scholarly consensus. This video presents the case that as many people as possible should be wearing a mask which is the most practical combination of efficacy, affordability and availability. For more details, you can skip to the conclusion using the relevant timestamp in the video description below. This video covers the following topics. 1. Mask types. 2. Mask filtration ratings. 3. The US Centers for Disease Control and World Health Organization's original advice. 4. The US CDC and WHO's current advice. 5. Scholarly studies on mask efficacy. 6. Who should wear which masks. First, let's look at mask types. This subject is often confused as a result of people using the wrong naming conventions. For example, you will often see reference to surgical masks, N95 masks and P100 masks, but only the first of these refers to a type of mask, while the other two are filtration ratings. There are two main types of unpowered masks, fabric barrier masks and respirators. A fabric barrier mask, as the name suggests, covers most of the user's face, typically using a combination of paper and a three-ply polymer such as polypropylene. The mask has cords which loop over the ears and has a thin metal wire to pinch the mask tightly over the bridge of the nose for a better fit. The most common fabric barrier mask in use is the surgical mask. The photos on screen now show examples of typical surgical masks. The main purpose of fabric barrier masks is to contain exhalation of contaminants from the user. It is not designed to keep contaminants contacting the user. Fabric barrier masks are designed primarily to protect other people from what comes out of your mouth, not to protect you from whatever is outside the mask. There are two main reasons why fabric barrier masks are suboptimal protection against external contaminants. Firstly, fabric barrier masks are porous and the holes in the fabric are too large to prevent small contaminants such as viruses from entering, though they can trap some microbes. Fortunately, some viral matter can still be stopped, for reasons we will discuss later. Secondly, fabric barrier masks are only fitted loosely to the face without creating an effective seal. Consequently, there are multiple entry points for external contaminants. This is more serious than the large pores of the mask's fabric, since the openings around the mask edges are a far larger and more accessible entry point for contaminants. A study by Patel et al. found that a standard natural fit surgical mask quote, captured particles poorly 
due to outward leakage around the face seal perimeter, around 5 to 20 percent, end quote. However, a better grade of surgical mask, designed to fit more closely to the face, has more effective particle capture. The same study by Patel et al. found that a secure fit ultra surgical mask's particle capture rate was as high as 50%, though this is still well below the 18 to 90% of an unsealed N95 mask or the 100% of a sealed N95 mask. Conversely, there are two main reasons why fabric barrier masks are effective at doing exactly what they are designed to do, protecting other people from what comes out of your mouth. Firstly, even though the pores in a fabric barrier mask are large, they are still effective at trapping large droplets of fluid expelled from the mouth and nose by coughing and sneezing, reducing significantly the possibility of spreading infectious material to other people. Secondly, Although contaminated air and droplets can be expelled through the loose-fitting sides of the mask, the quantity and mass of such air and droplets is typically very small, they are mainly directed down and away from other people, and their range is reduced greatly. A study by Milton et al. in 2013, entitled Influenza Virus Aerosols in Human Exhaled Breath, Particle Size, Culturability and Effect of Surgical Masks, tested how effective surgical masks were at trapping viral matter expelled from the mouth and nose of people infected with an influenza virus. The study found that even wearing a standard surgical mask, quote, nearly eliminated viral RNA detection in the coarse aerosol fraction with a 25-fold reduction in the number of viral copies, end quote. In other words, when someone with the influenza virus was wearing a surgical mask, the mask filtered out nearly all the viral particles in large droplets of infected fluid whenever the person coughed or sneezed. The study concluded that this data supported the CDC's recommendation for people with influenza-like illnesses to wear a surgical mask to help prevent them infecting healthy people through their exhalations. Additionally, Fabric barrier masks have the benefit of preventing you touching your face, which is a common vector of viral particles. If you're not used to wearing a fabric barrier mask, then it might feel uncomfortable and itchy, tempting you to scratch. But if you must scratch, then you should do so only from the outside of the mask, not the inside. If you do need to touch your face below the mask, wrap your finger in a tissue, scratch yourself, then dispose of the tissue immediately afterwards. Fabric barrier masks have a short lifespan and should be discarded immediately after use. It is typically not possible to sanitise or disinfect them due to the fragility of the material from which they are made. Now let's talk about respirator masks. Confusion can arise from the fact that the word respirator is used for both disposable unpowered masks and for the powered devices which are used in hospitals and other medical care centres. Those devices are sometimes also called ventilators, but they are typically not referred to as masks. To avoid confusion, this video will use the term respirator masks for the commonly used disposable unpowered masks. There are two main types of respirator masks. One piece disposable respirator masks, on screen now at left, and elastomeric half face piece respirator masks, on screen now at right. Like a fabric barrier mask, a respirator mask covers most of the user's face. However, a respirator mask is differentiated from a fabric barrier mask by two main features. Firstly, it fits close to the face, clinging to the skin to form a seal preventing contaminants entering the nose and mouth. Secondly, it not only presents a physical barrier, but incorporates air purifying components. These components purify the air by physically removing contaminants, which is why respirator masks are sometimes referred to as mechanical filter respirators. It is not because they have any moving parts. The main purpose of respirator masks is to prevent inhalation of contaminants by the user. Respirator masks are designed primarily to protect you from whatever is outside the mask, while at the same time protecting other people from what comes out of your mouth. This provides a significantly greater level of protection than fabric barrier masks. Like fabric barrier masks, Respirator masks also have the advantage of preventing you from touching your face. Respirator masks purify the air by removing contaminating particles in a number of ways. Multiple layers of fibres and chemical coatings, and occasionally, but not always, more sophisticated barriers such as electrostatic forces generated by combinations of material, 
or even antimicrobial treatments disrupt the ingress and flow of contaminating particles, intercepting them and trapping them in order to prevent them contacting the user. Although respirator masks are porous in order to allow air to enter, the holes are much smaller than those in fabric barrier masks, preventing even very small droplets and particles from entering or exiting the mask. Respirator masks may, but do not always, have a one-way exhalation valve allowing air to escape from directly in front of the user's mouth, taking a path of least resistance and reducing the amount of pressure on the sides of the mask when the user exhales. This respirator mask, on screen now, has an exhalation valve mounted in the centre front. The valve itself must conform to a specific filtration rating in order to maintain the integrity of the entire mask. Unlike fabric barrier masks, respirator masks require correct fitting in order to benefit the user. Wearing them improperly without a tight seal reduces their effectiveness dramatically. Ideally, individuals are issued with form-fitting respirator masks which have been made using a mould of their personal facial contours for an optimal fit. However, such masks are costly and time-consuming to make, and most users will benefit sufficiently from a well-fitted, common-use respirator mask. Users can check the seal of their mask by pressing it tightly to their face and exhaling hard. A strong sensation of air escaping through the sides of the mask indicates an imperfect fit. The information thus far has applied to both one-piece disposable respirator masks and elastomeric half-facepiece respirator masks. Now let's talk about how they're different. Like fabric barrier masks, one-piece respirator masks, on screen at left, are considered disposable. However, they have a much longer lifespan than fabric barrier masks. Some of them can be renewed by removing the mask's protective filter, sterilising the body of the mask and replacing the filter with a new one. In contrast, elastomeric half facepiece respirator masks, on screen at right, have an almost indefinite lifespan. The body of the mask is made of a rubber-like material which fits very closely to the skin, providing a highly effective air seal. Adjustable straps over the head and neck hold the mask in place firmly. Most importantly, these respirator masks use replaceable filters. After use, the body of the mask must be washed and sterilised, while the filters are discarded and replaced with new filters. These respirator masks always have an exhalation valve in the front. Now let's talk about mask filtration ratings. The most commonly known and currently discussed mask rating is N95, but what does this mean? What do mask ratings actually measure? On screen now is an image of respirator filter ratings established by the United States National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There are three respirator filter classes. N-series filters are not resistant to oil, which is what the N stands for. R-series filters are somewhat resistant to oil. And P-series filters are strongly resistant to oil. Each filter series is rated according to the percentage of airborne 0.3 micron particles it can exclude. The number 95 indicates a 95% filtration rate, 99 indicates a 99% filtration rate, and 100 indicates a 99.75 filtration rate. So an N95 mask rating indicates a filter which is not resistant to oil, and which excludes 95% of all airborne particles 0.3 microns or larger in size. Particles smaller than 0.3 microns may be excluded, but at a much less higher percentage. Respirator mask ratings differ according to the filter being used, not according to the mask's form factor. A one-piece disposable filtration mask might have a rating as low as N95 or as high as P100, depending on how it was made. On screen now are a one-piece disposable filtration mask with an N95 rating at top left and the same model of mask with a P100 rating at bottom left. Likewise, an elastomeric half facepiece respirator mask may have a rating as low as N95 or as high as P100 depending on the filter it is using. On screen now are an elastomeric half facepiece respirator mask with an N95 rated filter at top right and the same model of mask with a P100 rated filter at bottom right. 
In order to filter viral and microbial contaminants effectively, a respirator mask must be rated to at least N95. Consequently, if you want a face mask which will provide effective protection against you being infected with the coronavirus from other people, you should not wear a surgical mask. You should wear at least a one-piece disposable filtration mask rated to at least N95. In Europe, different filtration standards are used. On screen now is an image showing how European filtration standards EU143 and EU149 correspond to the US classifications. Put simply, N95 is equivalent to European class P2 or FFP2, N99 is equivalent to European class FFP3, and N100 is equivalent to European class P3. If you're looking at buying a filtration mask or filter and it only has the European standard classification, look for a P3 or FFP3 rating. Obviously, all this will depend on availability and affordability, as we'll discuss later. Some confusion has arisen due to the fact that viruses are typically smaller than the 0.3 microns which N95 and P100 filters are designed to trap. How can these filters protect you from particles and viruses less than 0.3 microns in size? The image on screen now shows a range of particles. At far right is a PM10, a typical large dust or smoke particle, 10 microns in size. To the left of that is a red blood cell, 7 microns in size. To the left of that is a PM2.5, a very small dust or smoke particle, 2.5 microns in size. To the left of that is a bacillus bacteria, 0.5 microns in size. And to the left of that is the coronavirus, 0.1 microns in size. Most surprisingly, the final particle at left is an example of a particle 0.007 microns in size, which the image says can still be excluded by some filtration masks. How does all this work? Since the coronavirus is 0.1 microns in size, how can it be trapped by a filter rated to only 0.3 microns? And how can such a filter trap even smaller particles down to 0.007 microns? The answer is that viruses do not travel independently. They typically contact the body through mechanical vectors, such as by adhering to larger particles of other matter. When you touch a surface contaminated by a virus, your skin actually picks up not the virus itself, but a dust particle or fomite to which the virus has adhered. In the same way, when someone coughs or sneezes, any viral matter they expel is suspended in the droplets of fluid from their nose or mouth. A study of respiratory droplets by Atkinson et al., published by the World Health Organization, explains that these droplets typically range from 0.5 to 12 microns in size. Even at the lower end of this scale, 0.5 microns is still much larger than the 0.3 micron particles from which an N95 or P100 mask can protect you. A droplet 0.5 microns in size may contain a coronavirus particle only 0.01 microns in size, but the droplet itself will be trapped on the outside of the mask, or at most on one of its outer layers, keeping the viral particle from reaching your face. Consequently, even a fabric barrier mask such as a basic surgical mask can provide some slight level of protection against external contamination by viral particles. Of course, this is only in ideal conditions, and viral matter carried by smaller droplets can still penetrate the mask. We will look at this in more detail later. Now let's look at the original coronavirus advice given by the US Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization. In an article last updated on the 18th of March 2020, entitled Coronavirus Disease, COVID-19, Advice for the Public, When and How to Use Masks, the WHO said, quote, If you are healthy, you only need to wear a mask if you are taking care of a person with suspected 2019 NCOV infection. End quote. This was clearly speaking of wearing a mask in order to protect yourself from being infected by other people. The same article also had instructions on quote, when and how to wear medical masks to protect against coronavirus. End quote. The masks discussed and shown in this article were only fabric barrier masks, specifically typical surgical masks. The article does not show or recommend usage of a mask with a higher filtration rating, such as a ventilator mask. 
Similarly, on the 30th January 2020, the CDC's telebriefing on the coronavirus situation said, quote, CDC does not currently recommend the use of face masks for the general public. The virus is not spreading in the general community, end quote. The briefing added, quote, We don't routinely recommend the use of face masks by the public to prevent respiratory illness and certainly are not recommending that at this time for this new virus, end quote. The next month, on the 12th of February 2020, the CDC repeated their previous advice. Once again, they said, quote, CDC does not currently recommend the use of face masks for the general public. The virus is not spreading in the community, end quote. They also advised that people who were sick or suspected of being infected but were still not hospitalised should be, quote, wearing a face mask when around other people and before entering a health care provider's office, end quote. This was an explicit reference to the importance of using a mask to avoid infecting other people, demonstrating the CDC was aware that mask wearing was effective in containing infection by reducing the possibility of viral matter being expelled from an infectious person. However, the CDC did not take this idea one step further and recommend mask wearing by the general public, regardless of whether or not they were symptomatic. So at this time, both the WHO and CDC were advising against the general public wearing masks, representing this as unnecessary. In both cases, the advice was overwhelmingly in the context of individuals taking steps to prevent themselves being infected by other people. In their second update, the CDC addressed the efficacy of masks to prevent the spread of the virus by mitigating the possibility of individuals spreading the virus to other people, but only recommended this for people already identified as infectious. Now let's look at the current advice given by the US CDC and the WHO. On the 3rd of April 2020, the CDC published an article entitled Recommendation regarding the use of cloth face coverings, especially in areas of significant community-based transmission. This article reversed the previous CDC advice, now recommending people wear, quote, cloth face coverings, end quote. The CDC explained that the reason for changing their position was the realisation that, quote, the virus can spread between people interacting in close proximity, for example, speaking, coughing or sneezing, even if those people are not exhibiting symptoms, end quote. This means that even people who are apparently healthy and who do not display any symptoms could be carrying and spreading the virus. Consequently, the more people wearing some kind of mask, just in case they are infected, the less likely it is that the virus will spread. The CDC clarified that the masks they were recommending were simple cloth face coverings, saying, quote, the cloth face coverings recommended are not surgical masks or N95 respirators, end quote. They advised that both surgical masks and N95 respirators were, quote, critical supplies that must continue to be reserved for healthcare workers and other medical first responders, end quote. The important point here was a shift in perspective from protecting healthy people catching the virus from others to reducing the possibility of infected people passing on the virus to others. On the 6th of April 2020, the WHO issued their own revised recommendation in a document entitled Advice on the Use of Masks in the Context of COVID-19. This article differed in some respects from the CDC guidelines and contained some advice which was unintuitive or self-contradictory. On page one, the document noted it was using the term medical masks to refer to basic fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks. It also stated explicitly, quote, this document does not focus on respirators, end quote. Consequently, all references to medical masks in the document refer only to fabric barrier masks. On the same page, the document stated, quote, Wearing a medical mask is one of the prevention measures that can limit the spread of certain respiratory viral diseases, including COVID-19, end quote. This is true and is a vital component in containing any viral outbreak. It's difficult to protect healthy people by giving them high-rated masks, such as respirator masks, to prevent them being infected, since high-rated masks are more expensive and in short supply. But it's a lot easier to reduce the danger of sick people infecting other people by ensuring they wear at least low-rated fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks, which reduce the amount of viral matter they expel from their mouths and noses, 
since simple fabric barrier masks are much cheaper and more readily available. The document made the point that fabric barrier masks can help prevent the spread of the virus from infectious people to healthy people. This is true. The document also noted that fabric barrier masks provide some limited protection against infection when worn by healthy people in regular close contact with infected people. This is also true. However, the document then went on to say, quote, There is currently no evidence that wearing a mask, whether medical or other types, by healthy persons in the wider community setting, including universal community masking, can prevent them from infection with respiratory viruses, including COVID-19. End quote. This is very confusing. There is an abundance of evidence that healthy people wearing high-rated respirator masks in a wider community setting can prevent them being infected with respiratory viruses, including the coronavirus. The document is also confusing because it repeatedly refers to the virus as COVID-19 in phrases such as, quote, the COVID-19 virus, end quote, and, quote, infected with COVID-19, end quote when in fact COVID-19 is the disease, not the virus. However, it does this inconsistently, sometimes referring to, quote, respiratory viral diseases, including COVID-19, end quote, treating COVID-19 as a disease. This gives the impression that the document was the product of notes from several different people using different terminology. On page two, the document says, quote, the wide use of masks by healthy people in the community setting is not supported by current evidence and carries uncertainties and critical risk, end quote. This is another confusing statement. Do they mean healthy people don't need to wear a mask in order to avoid infecting other people? That's obviously true, because they're not infectious themselves. Do they mean large numbers of healthy people shouldn't wear masks because the masks aren't protective? Well, that depends on the mask. Large numbers of healthy people wearing high-rated respirator masks would provide excellent protection and contribute significantly to the containment of the virus. That is supported by the current evidence. Large numbers of healthy people wearing even basic fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks, would also provide some protection, and contribute at least in a smaller way to the containment of the virus. That is also supported by current evidence. Even more confusingly, the document also says, quote, medical masks should be reserved for healthcare workers, end quote. When the document speaks of medical masks, it means basic fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks. It claims, quote, the use of medical masks in the community may create a false sense of security with neglect of other essential measures, such as hand hygiene practices and physical distancing, end quote. It also says that wearing a medical mask may cause people to touch their faces more frequently. However, the document cites no evidence in support of this. In fact, a number of clinical studies indicate the opposite, as we shall see. The document also says, quote, it is critical that medical masks and respirators be prioritised for healthcare workers, end quote. It makes sense to prioritise respirator masks for healthcare workers since these masks are high rated, offer excellent protection to healthy people from the virus, and because they are more expensive and in short supply. Still, it does not make sense to prioritise basic fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks, for healthcare workers, since they are much cheaper and more readily available, and since their use among the general public can contribute significantly to containment of the virus. Despite all this, later on page two, the document backflips again, citing the benefits of mask wearing by healthy people, saying, quote, potential advantages of the use of masks by healthy people in the community setting include reducing potential exposure risk from infected persons during the pre-symptomatic period and stigmatization of individuals wearing masks for source control, end quote. The use of the word masks here is again a reference to fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks. So here the document is contradicting what it said earlier, and acknowledging that use of surgical masks by healthy people in the community can help reduce the spread of the virus. So according to the WHO document, are basic fabric barrier masks effective in containing the virus if worn widely in the community by both infectious and healthy people? No, but also yes. Should they be worn by the general public in order to help contain the virus? No, but also yes. This five-page document was a mess of unclear and self-contradictory advice, which didn't even use standard technical terminology when referring to masks, the coronavirus, or the disease it causes. It's also worth noting that it contained a number of basic grammar and syntax errors. 
The entire document looks like it started life as a collection of suggestions by several different people, which were finally thrown hastily together by a single writer, and never passed through a stringent proofreading and validation editorial process. Some parts of it read like a Wikipedia article, with one editor making a claim, and then another editor following immediately after with a contradiction or counterclaim. A wide range of media outlets picked up on the CDC and WHO's change of position, and in some cases reported the facts far more clearly. An article by Time magazine noted that on the 3rd of April, the CDC, quote, advised Americans to wear non-medical cloth face coverings, including homemade coverings fashioned from household items in public settings like grocery stores and pharmacies, end quote. Similarly, the South China Morning Post said, quote, from the start, the World Health Organization said the answer was no. Masks should be worn by those who are sick and medical and care workers, end quote. Later noting that, quote, On Friday, both the US and Singapore switched to advising citizens to wear masks when they leave their homes. The WHO also made a U-turn itself, end quote. On the 4th of April, the Guardian newspaper published an article entitled To Help Stop Coronavirus, Everyone Should Be Wearing Face Masks. The science is clear. This article made the important point that the wearing of fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks, quote, only really pays off when most people do it, end quote, citing an FDA study which found that the more people in a population wore masks, the lower viral transmission rates fell. We will look at this study in more detail shortly. Now let's look at scholarly studies on mask efficacy. Firstly, we will look at fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks. A study in 2009 by Johnson et al. entitled A Quantitative Assessment of the Efficacy of Surgical and N95 Masks to Filter Influenza Virus in Patients with Acute Influenza Infection compares surgical masks with respirator masks rated to N95, finding, quote, Surgical and N95 masks were equally effective in preventing the spread of PCR-detectable influenza, end quote. The study noted, quote, Our findings support current guidelines recommending surgical or procedural masks be worn by patients with suspected influenza to limit viral dissemination to others, end quote. They concluded, quote, both surgical and N95 masks appear equally effective in preventing influenza dissemination from patients with confirmed influenza. End quote. A literature review and meta-analysis by McIntyre and Chuktai in 2015, entitled Face Masks for the Prevention of Infection in Healthcare and Community Settings, came to the same conclusion. They noted, quote, Face masks provide protection against infection in various community settings subject to compliance and early use. For healthcare workers, the evidence suggests that respirators offer superior protection to face masks. End quote. In April 2020, a large study by Leong et al. assessed the use of surgical masks in preventing the transmission of the coronavirus specifically. They said, quote, Our results indicate that surgical face masks could prevent transmission of human coronaviruses and influenza viruses from symptomatic individuals. They noted that surgical masks were efficacious at reducing the number of viral particles emitted from the nose and mouth of infected people, saying, quote, Our findings indicate that surgical masks can efficaciously reduce the emission of influenza virus particles into the environment in respiratory droplets, but not in aerosols. End quote. In other words, very small droplets containing viral particles can still escape surgical masks. Nevertheless, they concluded that surgical masks worn by infected people can still reduce significantly the amount of viral matter expelled in large respiratory droplets and in aerosols, saying, quote, This has important implications for control of COVID-19, suggesting that surgical face masks could be used by ill people to reduce onward transmission. Now let's look at who should wear which masks. Ventilator masks prevent you from infection by other people, as well as protecting other people from being infected by you. This requires a well-fitted ventilator mask rated to at least N95 and preferably P100. Fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks, are designed to protect other people being infected by you. They are not designed to protect you from being infected by other people, and their construction is suboptimal for the exclusion of viral particles carried in small droplets and aerosols. 
However, they still provide some protection from viral infection and are superior to cloth masks, whether homemade or industrially produced. Cloth masks, whether homemade or industrially produced, provide the lowest level of protection from infection by other people and only marginal protection for other people from you if you are infected. They should only be used as a last resort. For the general public, as many people as possible, whether healthy or not, should be wearing some kind of face mask. Ideally, this would be a ventilator mask rated to P100 or at least N95. If these are unavailable, the next most suitable mask is an industrially produced fabric barrier mask, such as a surgical mask. If those are unavailable, the next most suitable mask is a homemade or industrially produced cloth mask. As always, high-rated respirator masks, especially N95 and higher, such as P100, should be prioritised for frontline medical care workers. This should always be remembered. You might ask, well, what if I'm wearing a surgical mask but someone coughs on me? I'm still likely to be infected. That's actually why as many people as possible should be wearing masks. So when the other person does cough towards you, most of the viral matter they expel is caught by their mask, leaving very little to escape, nearly all of which should be trapped by your own mask. You might ask, but what about my eyes? A face mask doesn't protect them. The coronavirus is a respiratory tract virus. This means it must find its way to your respiratory tract in order to cause the disease COVID-19. A study by Tellier et al. in 2019 found that the virus which causes severe acute respiratory syndrome, quote, has to penetrate directly into the lower respiratory tract to preferentially replicate there before causing disease, end quote. The most common ways for the virus to enter your respiratory tract are through your mouth or nose as a result of you inhaling viral matter. Even if droplets of fluid containing the coronavirus do contact your eyes, there is no passage from your eyes to your respiratory tract. You cannot develop a respiratory infection by exposure of your eyes to the coronavirus. However, the coronavirus is known to cause pink eye or other forms of conjunctivitis when it comes into contact with the eye, so you should definitely be checked up if you develop those symptoms. Now let's break this all down and see why it makes sense for everyone to be wearing some kind of mask. Firstly, if you are sick, you should wear at least a professionally or industrially produced fabric barrier mask, such as a surgical mask, to reduce significantly your chance of expelling viral matter which can infect others. Secondly, if you're healthy, then wearing at least a fabric barrier mask, such as a surgical mask, will provide you with marginal protection from being infected by other people, but isn't necessary to protect other people from you because you can't infect them. Thirdly, if you don't know if you're infected or not, then wearing a surgical mask will provide you with marginal protection from being infected by other people and will help protect other people from you if you are sick and can infect them, but you don't know about it. This is the most important point. It is very likely that you won't know if you're sick or not, given the impracticality of testing everyone in the population and the amount of time it would take for you to determine definitively if you are sick or not by waiting for symptoms. If most people in the community are wearing at least a surgical mask, then it is far more likely that people who can infect others are already wearing something which can reduce the risk of that happening. Additionally, if healthy people are wearing at least a surgical mask, providing them with some protection from being infected, and infectious people are wearing at least a surgical mask, reducing significantly their likelihood of infecting other people, then the overall risk of infection for everyone is reduced. This is exactly why several nations in North and South East Asia, such as Korea, China, Japan, Vietnam and Taiwan, were already practicing widespread mask wearing, with a significant proportion of their populations wearing surgical masks even if they were not displaying symptoms of illness. This is well supported by experimental data. A study by Yan et al. in 2018, entitled Modeling the Effectiveness of Respiratory Protective Devices in Reducing Influenza Outbreak, found that if 50% of the population wore even fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks, the infection risk could be reduced by 50% prevalence and 20% cumulative incidence, while, quote, an 80% compliance rate essentially eliminated the influenza outbreak, end quote. 
On the 4th of April 2020, Victor Ting of the South China Morning Post quoted Professor David Hui Chu Zhong of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who emphasized the importance of ubiquitous mask wearing as an essential component of a successful response to the coronavirus. Xu Zhong stated, quote, Universal masking as a package of anti-epidemic measures, including greater social distancing and hand hygiene, has been instrumental in keeping COVID-19 in check, end quote. Conclusion Evidence from a range of scholarly studies and clinical experiments demonstrates that containment of the coronavirus could be improved significantly if at least 50% of the general public wears even basic fabric barrier masks, such as surgical masks. Containment would be improved even further if the proportion of mask wearing is raised to 80% of the general public. Although ventilator masks with filters rated to at least N95 and preferably P100 provide the highest level of protection of any unpowered masks, they are currently less accessible to the public due to supply shortages and the need to prioritise this equipment for frontline medical service staff. In contrast, simple cloth masks, whether made by hand or industrially, are of much less use and provide very little protection, though they are still better than nothing. In summary, you should obtain the best mask you can and wear it as much as possible. Stay safe and keep others safe.